what it's all about studying the book of Acts, is being in the glory land way. Amen, church? Amen. We're going to be covering chapters 9 through 15 this morning. And of course, as many are aware, we've just finished our first principle studies. And uh, in that class, we covered many sections in the book of Acts, such as chapters 10 and part of chapter 11. And so, in some respects, for the auditorium here this morning, we'll be skipping those sections, but indeed, we've covered them in previous classes. The title of our lesson this morning is Forcefully Advancing the Kingdom. It comes from Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. And I believe that today you're going to see that that's what the New Testament church was all about. They were a forcefully advancing movement of God. Let's turn to chapter 8. We left off there last week. And some of the very last words... We covered, we're in verse 1. And Saul was there, giving approval to Stephen's death, the first Christian martyr. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. But those who have been scattered preach the word wherever they went. Amen, church? Our first point is zeal for the truth. Let's go to chapter 9 now, verse 1. Remember, our last view is Saul holding the clothes of those that stoned the first Christian martyr, Stephen. In verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus. So that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they didn't see anyone. Saul got up on the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days, he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Right here is the famous journey to Damascus. Saul was on his way there to arrest the men and women of the way, the disciples of Jesus Christ. Not only to arrest them, but to put them to death. And on his way, a bright light comes upon him. And he's, it's so bright, it just knocks him to the ground. And he cries out, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul responds, well, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, I think he became a believer right then. Amen, guys? But you know, when he tried to get off the ground, he tried to open his eyes and he could see nothing. See, for so long, Saul thought he understood the truth. He was zealous for the truth. But he was struck down by the light of Jesus. And when he opened his eyes... He could see nothing, for he was blind, and he understood for the first time that he was in the darkness. Come on, bro. Read. And the Bible says that for three days he prays and he fasts in this condition. Wow. And we read on in verse 10. All right. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he's praying. In a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him and restore his sight. You see, Ananias had the gift of healing. Amen, guys? Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. 
And he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. You know, a lot of people think, man, I want to call Paul and I, I just want him to be blessed beyond anything you could imagine. And right here, God says, I want to show him how much he must suffer for my name. Verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Well, we understand from our earlier study in First Principles that Ananias had been given the gift of healing. And the gift of healing was done by the laying on of hands. And so Ananias comes to Paul and he says, I give you two things. First of all, I'm going to give you your sight. And then secondly, I'm going to have you be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so he lays his hands on Saul. He prays and scales fall from Paul's eye. He could see. And then the Bible says he's baptized. And we know from Acts 2.38 that when you're baptized, when you repent and you're baptized, you receive the forgiveness of sins and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen, guys? Amen. You know, but how many of us think that we've been zealous for the truth? But we've actually been in darkness with scales on our eyes. You know, I was raised by parents that did not believe in Jesus. And as a teenager, I started going to this uh, fundamental denominational church. After all, there were a lot of good-looking girls in the youth group. <laughs> but, but there was a sincerity. And so after several months, I got serious. And I was told that... In order to become a Christian, all I need to do is just say a prayer and Jesus would come into my heart. I said the prayer, I said it very sincerely. And I believed at that point that Jesus came into my heart and my sins were forgiven and I lived accordingly. And I was very zealous. Our little youth group in one year time grew from about 20 to 80. I mean, we shared our faith. And yet as the years passed, I went to college, and I was even asked to lead a Bible study in the denominational church that I was a part of there. And yet my life became more and more compromised. I pledged the fraternity, and the night that I was initiated into the fraternity, I was given a date, and I just fell into every sin except for going all the way with the girl. Well, I felt terrible, but then on, on Monday, it was, it, was, it, was, it was what really broke me. We had dinner at the fraternity house, and one of my new fraternity brothers, who would someday become a true Christian, after I forgave him of this upcoming story, <laughs> got on up and he says, Brothers, this weekend was an incredible party time, and we need to give out the award, the hot and nasty award. I believe it should go to none other than our new brother, Kip McKean. Let's give it up for him. I called myself a Christian. I had hickeys all over my neck. And you know something? I, I walked away there so shamed by my sin. But it was only then that I began to even get a sense that I was in the darkness. Two weeks later, someone invited me to church. Because I think God knew understood I wasn't ready. And a few weeks after that, they sat down and they laid out how to become a true Christian. Amen. That you had to have faith. That you had to repent of your sins. You had to turn from the darkness and turn to the light and be a disciple. And then be water baptized to have your sins forgiven and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I was so ticked off they were telling me I wasn't saved. You see, I was zealous for the truth. But you know, scales had to fall from my eyes. I studied the scriptures all that Sunday night, all the next day. And at 1.30 in the morning, late Monday night or early Tuesday morning, April 11, 1972, I was baptized into Christ. You know, I think there are a lot of people that are like me that are very sincere in their faith. 
but have been carried along by false doctrines about salvation. Yeah. And you have scales on your eyes. Because there's no discipling, there's darkness that's come into your life. Others even call themselves disciples and have been baptized for remission of sins, but they have scales on their eyes as well. Because there's been nobody in their life, there's been no connection to God. I'll never forget uh, Kathy and coming to church, their first service with uh, Luis. Basically, they had a, a fight the night before. And it was her birthday, so Louise says, well, what do you want? She says, I want to go to Kip and Elena's church. <laughs> she says, okay. Well, it's kind of neat, because after she'd come for a couple of weeks, the scales started to fall from her eyes. And in talking about coming and placing membership, she says, well, the day I placed membership was the day I was restored in my personal relationship with God. There are a lot of people out there that call themselves baptized disciples, that have scales in their eyes, that are a long ways from God. They may even be attending some church. But there's no personal relationship with God. And the scales need to come down. And you need to see that you need to be restored to God. Amen, guys? You can be zealous for the truth, but you can be wrong. Just like our brother, Paul. Let's read on. Right after he's baptized, look what he does. Verse 19. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Notice he's a baby Christian and he's already preaching the Word. How many of us that are newly baptized think, well, no, I can't preach the Word. I don't know the Bible that well. Listen, you know it well enough to say, hey, look what happened to my life. Paul's out there preaching. Look, verse 21. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, is he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem amongst all those who call on his name? And as they come here to take them as prisoners to chief priests, yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. You want to grow more and more powerful? Then you get out there and preach the word. Amen, guys? Verse 23. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by the night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. Now, this is a very significant event in the life of Paul. He actually talks about this again in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 36. Because here he is, the new zealot for God. And now he's sneaking out of the city <laughs> through a hole in the wall in a basket. I mean, he's the true first basket case right there. Oh, no. And it just wasn't his, his sense of being victorious and strong. And he remembered and he records it as a point of weakness. Now, look at the text. When Paul came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing he really was a disciple. Well, now we understand right here that there's a huge gap in the account. See, a lot of people wonder why there's not more details about Paul's life here or there. The book of Acts is not about the life of Paul. The book of Acts is about the church starting in Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the world. And right here, Paul begins to be propellant. But there's a very important time in Paul's life that has great significance. Let's go over and find out this three-year gap. Go to Galatians chapter 1. This is, this is super exciting, guys. Verse 11. I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached to you was not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Some think this is when Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. No, he's referring to something else. For you've heard my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the tradition of my fathers. You know, it occurred to me as I've been studying out this passage, Paul dwelt on this theme of being zealous for God over and over again. He talked about it in the book of Philippians. He talked about it in the book of Romans. And he, of course, explains it right here in the book of Galatians. There's something he attached to it. And upon further study, it's very interesting. 
the Jews of that day, there were two figures in the Bible that represented zeal. I bet you could get them. One is Phineas. Remember the zealot who saw the Jew with the non-faith Moabite woman and he killed him? And the other was Elijah who slew the 450 prophets of Baal. So this is the mindset of the first century Jew. Now you got to understand, it was extraordinary what Phineas did for the honor of God. He killed these people because of his zeal for God. What Paul was doing was extraordinary. There weren't very many other guys persecuting the disciples to the point of death. He saw himself as a young Phineas. Now let's look at the parallel of Elijah comes. Verse 15. But when God, who set me apart from birth, we all have a purpose, amen guys? And called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, so I might preach among the Gentiles, I did not consult any man. Nor did I go up immediately to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. But I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him 15 days. Paul goes out of his way to say, I did not go immediately to Jerusalem. He makes a point of that. Why? Because as I got my revelation directly from God. And he makes this reference. I did not go to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Implication, he becomes an apostle at that point. Now, interestingly enough, there's only two places in all the New Testament the word Arabia is mentioned. And they're both in the book of Galatians. Galatians 1, right here in verse 17 but over in Galatians 4. Let's look at it. <clears throat> Paul writes in verse 25. Now Hagar stands from Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. Many of the textbooks and commentaries have different thoughts about what Arabia was back in the first century. But nobody disputes that in the mind of Paul, in Arabia was Mount Sinai. So what happened? I think it's very clear. He was a young Phineas in his mind, and he also was an Elijah in his mind. What happened to Elijah? Well, he slew the 450 prophets of Baal, and then Jezebel got ticked off at him, remember that? And wanted to kill him, and what did Elijah do? He flees to Mount Horeb. Paul, in his shame, escapes to a hole in the wall in a basket, and he flees to Arabia. Where? To Mount Sinai. Why? Because it was on Sinai that Moses got the revelation from God. Why three years being apart from the apostles? Well, because he became an apostle by revelation. The apostles, the twelve, we know, walked with Jesus for three years. And now there's this three-year period that Paul has with Jesus. He then goes to Jerusalem and we pick up the text. Is that pretty cool or not, guys? Let's go back now. Chapter 9. Verse 26. When Paul came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing he really was a disciple. This is after three years. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told him how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit and it grew in numbers living in the fear of of the Lord. And so now, by the middle of chapter 9, we've got the word of God from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria. And now where are we going to go? To the ends of the world. Amen? So our first point was zeal for the truth. Our second is zeal to preach. In chapter 10, of course, we have the record of Peter and Cornelius 
God working simultaneously with both of them so that Peter could bring the message to the Gentiles. Peter reports this in chapter 11, but look what's going on correspondingly to this in verse 19 of chapter 11. Zeal to preach. Now those who have been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Now this is, this is quite curious. We find that the scattering is, of course, in Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. This is about seven years after the New Testament church begins. The accurate date, probably, for the beginning of the church was 29 A.D. So the date right here is about 36 A.D., an accurate date. And for the first seven years of Christianity, get this, the only people that could become disciples were Jews. But there were these zealots coming out of Jerusalem just preaching the word. They didn't even know all that had gone on with Peter and Cornelius and with the apostles. But they were just so fired up, they ran out of Jews to talk to, and they started talking to Gentiles, and they started becoming Christians. Is that incredible or not? Well, look at this. Yeah, we all need to thank, because most of us in this room are Gentiles. Amen, guys? Verse 30. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch. And began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church of Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Well, right here we hear about Antioch. Antioch is on the eastern side, just due north of Jerusalem. Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire in that day. The largest was Rome, the second, Alexander, and the third largest was Antioch. It was perhaps the second most significant city because it was through Antioch that the Silk Road went into India and then on into China. And it was covered by merchants all the time. So this was the big crossroads city. And so, this is so exciting because so many people are turning to the Lord. As we talked about last week, some people have estimated that the church at Antioch grew to be 50,000 disciples. Now, it's, it's, it's exciting because the apostles now in Jerusalem go, wow, yeah, even, even Gentiles can become Christians and inherit salvation. And so when they hear all the good news coming down from Antioch, they send one of their best preachers, Barnabas, to go up there. And the Bible says in verse 23, and I love this, when he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God. What was the evidence of the grace of God? What was the numbers of people that had responded to Jesus Christ? The changed lives. You see, what is a church that, that evidences the grace of God? Somebody that gets up in the pulpit every Sunday and says, Oh, grace you, grace you. Don't worry about your sins. That doesn't evidence the grace of God. The evidence of the grace of God is in a church where people are coming to Christ all the time. Amen. Where scores of people are being baptized. Many people are returning back to the Lord. This is what Barnabas saw was the evidence of the grace of God. Are you with me right there, church? Amen. Now look at this. Verse 25. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus, looked for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year... Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. You see, in the Bible, the word Christian is synonymous with the word disciple. If you're not a disciple, then you're not a Christian. Now, the world has made many definitions of Christian, but the Bible has one. You've got to be a sold-out disciple of Jesus Christ. You know, it's kind of cool right here. Barnabas has gone all the way up to Antioch. He's preaching the word. Scores of people are coming to Christ. It's incredible. And he starts saying to himself, man, the work is too much for me. And he says, I got I to get someone to help me. He goes, Saul. Saul of Tarsus. He, he can be my partner. And so he gets Saul and even more people come to Christ. Look what happens. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Some, one of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. 
So right here, we, we don't see little autonomous churches. We see a movement of churches that are helping each other and even sharing resources. Do you see that right here, guys? And we see for the first time this partnership of Barnabas and Saul. After all, it was Barnabas who had the guts to stand up to the apostles and say, Hey, Saul really is a convert. And he saw something special in him. He went all the way to get him. And you know something? Isn't it interesting that Jesus, even when he sent the apostles out, sent them out two by two? Paul talks about having partners in the gospel. People to work with. We, we even intuitively recognize that. I mean, marriage is supposed to be a partnership. Amen, guys? But, you know, one of the things that, that, that I've found, and I know a lot of other brothers and sisters have found, is that you need somebody to work with. And, and that's exactly how Barnabas felt. You know, one of the brothers in the church right here I felt has been really ministered. That, that's Ron Harding. You know, we appreciate Ron. Ron, Ron. Ron has brought a lot of people to Christ. Ron has restored a lot of people to the Lord. But what happened, it seemed like everybody got baptized, everybody got restored, got, got going to another Bible talk, and they're just leaving him all alone in Riverside right there. <laughs> and even though he'd affect a lot of people, he was feeling lonely. Well, then the Holy Spirit worked through financial challenges and moved him right down here this weekend down to Irvine. Well, now, now he and Jay, who also was feeling a little bit lonely, are now partners in the gospel, and they're fired up in the Lord. Are you with me right here? You see, yeah, you need a disciple, but you also need a partner, someone to work side by side with. What, what bonds people together, what brings people together in this unique relationship? The fact that we all meet in the same congregation at the scriptural time of 10 o'clock every Sunday morning? No, no, no. The bond we share in Christ is when we work together to change somebody's life that doesn't think they can change. To change a marriage and to give it hope. When they're on the verge of divorce. When you get into somebody's life who's thinking about suicide. And the two of you get in there, you study the word. And she becomes a disciple. See, that's what bonds relationships. It's doing the work of God. It's not sitting next to each other at church. The tightness of it comes from being partners in the gospel. Who is your partner? Who's your partner? Third point. Zeal to pray. We've got to have zeal to pray if we're going to be God's church. Amen, guys? Chapter 12. This is, this is powerful good stuff right here. Verse 1. It's about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Oh my goodness. The first apostle dies. He's martyred. Wow. That's just like Jesus prophesied. When he saw that this had pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads or four soldiers each. That's 16 guys. Okay, guys? Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Now let's put ourselves right in this situation. The word has been preached, but now the backlash of persecution has come. James has been arrested and killed. And Herod goes, wow, I'm more popular than ever for killing this guy. I'm going to arrest one of their other leaders. I arrest Peter. And so from, from one point of view, from the perspective of that day, from a humanistic perspective, Peter was going to die. Now the Bible says right here that the church began to earnestly pray to God. For what? For Peter's release. But you got to understand, in the mind of even some of the disciples, this would have been an outrageous, outlandish, seemingly impossible prayer to be answered. Because after all, God had not spared James. Verse 6. 
The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between his two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and light shone in his cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Hey, quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. He thought this was a cranking dream. <laughs> he goes, oh, that's cool. Light coming into my cell. Chains fall off. Dang, this is awesome. Oh, thank you, angel, for my sandals. That's awesome. Oh, yeah, we'll just walk out between the centuries. This is, this is, this is, this is an awesome dream. Verse 10. They passed by the first and the second guards and came to the iron gate leading the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. When this had dawned on him. I mean, he wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed. That should give a lot of us hope out there. Amen, guys? God can still use you. Amen? When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Okay, now we get a good kind of porthole into what the New Testament church looked like. The New Testament church didn't gather in a, a, a building with a steeple in it and, and a little white building with a white fence around it. Church buildings didn't even come to effect until 300 ADs. The church met in small groups in house churches. And so right now, all over Jerusalem, disciples are gathered in homes. That's why Paul went from house to house persecuting them. They're gathered in homes, praying earnestly to God, please, free Peter! Verse 13. Peter knocked on the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening, saying, Peter's at the door! Peter's at the door! You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept on insisting it was so, they said, it must be his angel. Now, you've got to picture this. <laughs> Here are all these disciples. They're in the living room, probably holding hands. Lord, please free Peter. Please get him out. Spare his life. Do anything. And they hear... And, of course, it's always to the youngest person have to answer the door. Because these people were busy praying. Whoa! Get, 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 the, get the door. The rest of us, we're, we're praying. She goes, you know, kind of a little bit disgusted. She was the youngest person, had to go do it. And, of course, the door's locked because, I mean, it's dangerous being a disciple. She hears the door, people knock it. She goes, who is it? She says, it's me, Peter. Is it really you? Yeah, it's me, Peter. She goes, oh, that's awesome. So she runs back in the living room, and she goes, guys, 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 I got, I got something really exciting. Peter's at the door. Our prayers have been answered. And to show you the faith of first, first century Christians, they go, you are out of your mind, girl. You are out of your mind. No, no, no. I know it's Peter. Okay, maybe it's his angel. Well, let's, let's see what happens. Verse 16. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hands for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the brothers about this, he said. And then he left for another place. Wow. wow. Zeal to pray. Zeal to pray the seemingly impossible prayer. You got any dreams that need to be prayed about? You got some impossible situations you've gotten yourself into? You got some people you know that just seemingly are trapped by life? Yeah. It's time to earnestly pray. But I don't know if I believe. It's time to earnestly pray. Amen, bro. Amen. <clears throat> I'll never forget when Lee and I first came to L.A. in 1990. One of the first baptisms we had was at UCLA. A young Latin girl named Gabby. And she was, she was quite something special. And she had such a heart for her family, and particularly for her mom. And after a couple of months of being a disciple, 
she started praying, God, do anything it takes to get my mom to church. Now that's a radical prayer. Do anything it takes to get my mom to church. A couple months later in June, she falls very sick. She had a congenital problem. And she was taken to the UCLA Medical Center. Her mom never left her side. But because of that, she started seeing all the disciples that would come and visit her throughout the day and the love and the joy and the prayers. Monday, before she passed away on Wednesday, her last words to one of the girls was, You know, I'm not afraid to die. I'm a Christian. I know I'm saved. But one thing you got to do for me, get my mom to church Sunday. She died Wednesday. They had the funeral that weekend. And Sunday, her mom came to church. And in August, her mom was baptized into Christ. What's your impossible prayer? But what are you willing to pray? God, do anything it takes? You know, for me, and I know for you, you've got people that you love, friends, neighbors, co-workers, family, parents, sons, daughters, that may be away from the Lord, maybe they've never been baptized, maybe they've been baptized and they've fallen away. Maybe Gabby's faith needs to be imitated. Maybe we need to be praying, God, do whatever it takes to this person, short of taking their life, so that they will become a Christian. How earnestly, how zealously are you going to pray to your Father in Heaven? Let's move on. Back to the text, chapter 12. This important little footnote right here in verse 18, chapter 12. In the morning, there was no small commotion amongst the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. This is very important for later on in the book of Acts to remember. That when a Roman guard allows his prisoner to escape, he will be killed. Remember that. Let's keep going. Then when Herod came from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there for a while, he had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience with him, having secured the support of Blastus. Now that's not a hardline brother. That's just that's a non-Christian guy right here. <laughs> a trusted personal servant of the king. They asked for peace because they depend on the king's country for their food supply. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, This is the voice of a god, not a man. Immediately because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. Josephus, the Jewish historian, verifies that. That on that day, Herod was struck down with a pain in his abdomen. And he died five days later. Secular history always matches the word of God. Amen? Verse 24. But the word of God continued to increase and spread. We're not talking about little autonomous churches set up. We are talking about a collective movement of disciples that are beginning to sweep the world. Are you with me right here? Now watch this. Verse 25. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem taking with them John, also called Mark. Wow, we just, we just met this young man earlier in verse 12 of, of chapter 12. It says, when this had dawned on Peter, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark. This is John Mark. Well, who is John Mark? Well, we find from Colossians 4.10 that he is the cousin of Barnabas. Can you imagine the expectations on this guy? From 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, we find that he is Peter's son in the faith. No wonder Peter was so close to that family. And that family so close to Peter. So here he is. Barnabas and Saul take him back to Antioch. Chapter 13, verse 1. Our fourth point. Zeal for the mission. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, 
Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. I mean, right here is a beautiful example of how church leadership always needs to reflect the demographics of the people. Remember, Antioch was the crossroads city, third largest city in the Roman Empire. Had people coming through the Silk Road, through the whole Roman Empire all the time. Well, who were the leaders of church? Well, first of all, it was the dynamic preacher Barnabas, the son of encouragement. The guy that gave up his field, sold everything he had so that the apostles could use it to help the poor. Then Simeon called Niger. Niger means black. So this is a black guy right here. Amen? <laughs> then Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene is northern Africa. So you have a North African dude. And then Manian. who brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. A rich guy. Of royal blood. Who gave it all up to be an evangelist. And Saul. Now tell me, that isn't a cranking leadership or not. Is that awesome or not, guys? <gasps> Verse 2, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, that's what true church leadership does. Amen, guys? The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I've called them. So after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit. Let's just stop right there. You know, in a few months, some of us have been talking about with a great deal of joy that the City of Angels Church is going to be sending out a new church planting to Manhattan. But from a biblical perspective, that is not true. The Bible teaches that when Barnabas and Saul were sent out, they weren't sent out by the church at Antioch. They were sent out by the Holy Spirit. You see, when the, when the disciples came down from Portland, down here to Los Angeles, that wasn't sent out from the Portland church. That was sent out by the Holy Spirit. God works through his church. Are you with me right here? Let's keep going. The two of them sent on the way by the Holy Spirit went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. Ah, this is the first missionary journey. And Barnabas says, hey, I want to go back home to Cyprus and make sure the word gets preached there. Amen, guys? When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. Oh, baby. There's John Mark, son of the faith of Peter, cousin of Barnabas, young champion of the church. He's a helper on the first missionary journey of Barnabas and Paul. Verse 6. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. Well now, that's a tough name for Christians to deal with. <laughs> they come to Paphos and they meet this Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar Jesus. Now, Bar Jesus, Bar means son of. So this guy's name is Son of Jesus. And he's a false prophet. Really hurts your message. It can get confusing. You know what I'm talking about? So Paul's going to have to straighten things out, I think. He says, This Bar Jesus, wasn't it? Attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, You're a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that's right. You're full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind, and for a time you'll be able to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching of the Lord. He was an intelligent man. Amen, guys? Now I don't think we fully get the picture of what happens right here. This bar Jesus guy starts trying to poison the proconsul from listening to Paul and Silas, and Paul gets ticked off. And he confronts them. He says, You're not Bar Jesus. You are not a son of Jesus. You are a son of the devil. And God is going to strike you blind. Boom! He goes blind. Proconsul goes, I believe. <laughs> Amen. 
It was a great missionary journey. I mean, people were coming to faith all the time. Look at the next verse. Pivotal. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Pergian and Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. Oh my goodness. John Mark, the young hero of the church, deserts the first missionary expedition. It's not clear what happens. Could have been the travel. Could have been sickness. Could have been just plain, unadulterated cowardice. But he quits. And he goes back to Jerusalem. Well, the preceding chapter talks about preaching the word in Pisidian Antioch. Now, Antioch is the third largest city. We talked about that one. That's at the far eastern side of Turkey. Pisidian Antioch is in middle Turkey. And they go there, they preach in the synagogue, a lot of people come, but then the synagogue repels them, and so they're forced to preach to the Gentiles. And we read in verse 48 these words. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread to the whole region. Once more, do you get a sense of movement right here? A movement was happening. It was spreading through the whole region. But the Jews inside the god praying women of high standing and leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. So they shook the dust from their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. When you get persecuted, are you fired up? Amen? Look what happens. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual in the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. Well, right here, we see that it's not just good enough to preach the word. But we need to learn to become effective in preaching the word. And we become effective by studying the word of God. And by having people involved in our life and being humble enough to receive discipling. When you see someone that's particularly effective in winning people to Christ... You need to go and learn from. You need to be humble. Are you with me right here? Because we've got to have a goal of being effective. Secondly, even the most effective people are going to have other people try to go after the people they're teaching and poison their minds. That happened in the first century. It's going to happen in the 21st century. People are going to say negative things about an evangelistic church that's trying to turn the world upside down. They're going to say it with their mouths. They're going to try to poison people. They'll even write things today on the internet that are half-truths and flat-out lies. Why? Because they don't want people to become sold-out disciples of Jesus Christ. You need to understand, there will be persecution. Deal with it. And have a zeal for the mission. Let's go on. Chapter 14, verse 8. In Lystra, there sat a man crippled in his feet, who was lame from birth and never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him and saw that he had faith to be healed and called out, Stand up on your feet! At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in Lyconian language, The gods have come down for us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus. And Paul they called Hermes because he was chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to him. But we know that the Roman poet Ovid wrote a whole book about different uh, stories and mythology. And one of them was about Zeus and Hermes visiting uh, this particular city of Lystra. And at that particular time, they did not receive them well. So now they think Zeus and Hermes, or you might know them, Jupiter and, and Mercury, are now back. And they're going, hey, we blew it the first time, but we are not blowing it the second time. So they're super, super nice to Paul and Barnabas. Why? Because they see this crippled guy heal. And their only explanation is, these must be the gods returned to us. Let's look what happens. Verse 14. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard this, they tore their clothes and rushed out to the crowd shouting, Men, why are you doing this? We two are only men, humans like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in him. In the past, he let all nations go their way. Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven 
and crops in their season. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some of the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up, went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. Wow. They're preaching the word. The Jews come and poison the people. And the people that were trying to sacrifice to make them gods, now turn on them. And stone Paul. Now some people have thought that Paul died. I don't think so. I think he was just so close to death, they didn't even notice him bleeding, breathing. And so they drag him out of the city, thinking he was dead. And they leave him. Now, of course, the question has to come, where's Barnabas? <laughs> Where are my friends? Isn't it interesting that the worst persecution comes when you're the most lonely? Well, you know, the cool thing is, the disciples that gather around him, and you just kind of see Paul slowly start moving and getting up, and then, and then the Bible says, he gets up, and just... Because Paul is Paul. He goes, guys, we're going back in the city. Paul, they just stole you. (laughs) We're going back. I want to make a statement. None of this creeping out through a little hole in the wall in a basket. I'm walking back in that city. But then he goes, he left the next day. Amen. (laughs) Verse 21. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthened the disciples, encouraged them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. You know, for some of us, church is almost a Disneyland affair. I come to church, I wonder if they have some good songs today. I wonder if I'm going to see so-and-so there. I'm sure the communion will be great and I'm sure the preacher will have some nice things from the Bible to share with us and, and I'll get a really cranking insight. Too many come to church to be entertained. Come on, bro. Preach that. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. I think church is fun. It's great to come together. Amen, church? With your partners in the gospel. With people that have a sense of purpose in God and in Christ. But for too many people of the 21st century, church is a Disneyland fun affair. And when it stops being fun, they quit. Oh, I have to travel an hour. That's too far. I don't have enough money for gas. Can you imagine these guys saying stuff like that? The church was the kingdom. This was their priority. This was their passion. This is what Jesus died for. How can we cheapen it? We need to hold the church dear. It's not to be worshipped. But it is to be loved. Someone said that Christ is the head of the body as church. And the body is where you get the hugs. Amen, guys? How do you get a hug from God? It's at church. Through the love of the brothers and the sisters. Amen, guys? We need to have a zeal for the mission. Let me ask you something. How zealous have you been this week? How many people have you talked to about coming to church to see God, to see the love of the disciples? How many people have you shared your faith with? Does it match the testimony of the disciples? Are you willing to do what they did? Some, well, I'm feeling weary. I'm feeling worn out. Listen, have you been stoned and left for dead? You know, we have such a miserable, pathetic view of the kind of commitment these people had. For them, it was a life and death experience every day. And that's what made it so special. It was incredible. It was worth living for. And it was worth dying for. Because the world was going to be changed through Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's close out in chapter 15. Zeal for unity. 
Paul and Barnabas find their way back to Antioch. We read this. Verse 1. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas to a sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the brothers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. I mean, church was a a good news celebration. Amen, guys? Verse 5. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. And so here we see the great controversy that was about to divide the church. Some in the church were saying, and perhaps the majority of the Jews were saying, that in order to be saved, it took a lot more than just baptism in the blood of Jesus. They needed to be circumcised to become a true Jew. Well, then Peter gets up and he refutes that. And then we read in verse 12 these words. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Now, is this James the apostle? No, he's dead. This is James, the half-brother of Jesus. When they finished, James spoke up, brothers. Listen to me. Whoa. Can you imagine it? I mean, the half-brother of Jesus? I mean, he might have looked a little bit like Jesus. So here's this whole assembly of elders and apostles and all the brothers that are up in arms. And James gets on up there. They've heard from the circumcision party. They've heard from Peter, Barnabas, and Paul. He says, brothers, listen to me. Oh, baby. (laughs) Simon has described to us how God first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this as is written. After I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. That the remnant of men may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things that have been known for ages. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from meats of strangled animals and from blood. For Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every occasion. Right here, James gets up and says, this is what we're going to do. There was no vote. There was no casting lots. Just sheer, unadulterated leadership that said, this is right. right. Come on, bro. Most likely in the crowd were a majority of Jewish disciples who were probably thinking, yeah, you do have to be circumcised to be saved. James said, no. The truth is clear. They were not about building the democracy of God. No. It was all about the kingdom of God. Yeah. And for Americans, that's sometimes hard to accept because we think democracy is the highest form of government. But when you have God leading his people and you have God's word as your guide, then you have absolute authority and you know that it's absolute truth. Amen? And so a decision was made by James that the brothers felt good about to send a letter out to all the churches that said, hey, you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. But you do have to obey the Word of God. Let's close it out in the latter part of chapter 15. A bit ironic after this great zeal for unity. <clears throat> Verse 36. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the Word of the Lord and see how they're doing. He says, man, let's go back and, and, and visit the churches and encourage them, all the churches we started. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul didn't think it was wise to take them because he deserted them in Pamphylia and not count and continue with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. 
But Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. It's a rather sad note right here. After a great zeal for unity, we find the two men that had most influenced the church to accept the Gentiles now were splitting. They weren't disfellowshipping each other, but they were going in different directions. It seems clear from the passage that the brothers commended Paul. And so Paul chose for his new partner a guy named Silas. Now who was Silas? Well, look at verse 32. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets. Well, now, if you're going to get a partner, a prophet's a pretty good partner. Amen, guys? So he says, okay, we're going to commend Paul and Silas to go back and visit all the new churches. But part of us, the Bible says, takes John Mark, even though this young man had disappointed. He probably was totally broken hearted. His dreams were gone. He was shamed in front of the whole assembly. And Barnabas says, hey, how about you just come back with me home to Cyprus? It's very interesting. By Colossians 4, when Paul's in prison, we find that John Mark is with Paul. Most excitingly, though, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is written late 66 AD, very shortly before Paul was going to be beheaded and martyred for the cause of Christ. He's writing to Timothy, his beloved son in the faith, but look what he writes in verse 9. Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he's loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Well, Demas was a preacher, and he fell away. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to the Maltia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is helpful to my ministry. Now, we always say, oh, it's so awesome, the kind of relationship that Paul had with Timothy. That he wanted him there at the very end before he was going to be martyred for Christ. But who else does he ask for? Not just Timothy to come, but the only other person he asked to come is John Mark. Wow. We see two great things here. Number one, the power of forgiveness. And when forgiveness is complete, unity is restored. You know, you know how it is. If you, if you have two little kids and they're fighting and grumbling against each other and, you know, as a parent, you want to see your kids get along, don't you? And so you say, okay, apologize. <laughs> now that wasn't an apology. And finally, when they start crying, go, I'm sorry. And then, you know, they apologize. And when they go back playing together, you know that forgiveness has taken place. Are you with me right here? See, we know when we've forgiven somebody. Yeah, yeah. Because we can go back into fellowship with them. The interesting thing we see right here secondarily is for a lot of people, I think they can identify with John Mark. John Mark was the young hero. The son of the faith of Peter. The cousin of Barnabas. On the first missionary journey. And then he tanked it. He tanked it. He left. He cowered out and left it. His dreams were gone. He was broken hearted. He was shamed. But a guy named Barnabas put his arm around him and said, Hey, I believe in you. I'll restore you. And a few years' time, John's dreams were not only restored, but now he became one of the closest of all disciples to Paul. Paul dies in early 67 A.D. And almost all commentators say that John Mark writes the first gospel, the gospel of Mark, in the late 60s A.D., early 70s. You see, John Mark could have said, man, my glory days were back there when we were praying for Peter and I remember Rhoda coming on in and we made fun of her. But Peter had been delivered. 
My glory days were hanging out with Barnabas and Paul. My glory days were going on the first missionary journey. And then that's all he could talk about for the rest of his life. You know, there's a song. One of my favorite performers is Bruce Springsteen. And many years ago, he, he did this song called Glory Days. I'll sing, I'm not going to sing, I'll say a couple verses for you here. <clears throat> well, the way my voice, my way my voice is this morning, I'd probably sing like him, I don't know. The title of the song is Glory Days. Some of you young people may not know it, but listen. He said, I had a friend who was a big baseball player back in high school. He could throw a speedball by you, make you look like a fool, boy. So on the other night at this roadside bar, I was walking in and he was walking out. We went back inside, sat down, had a few drinks, but all we kept talking about was glory days. Well, they'll pass you by. Glory days, the wink of a young girl's eye. Glory days. Glory days. Last verse. I think I'm going down to the well tonight, and I'm going to drink till I get my fill. And I hope when I get old, I don't sit around thinking about, but I probably will. Yeah, just sitting back trying to recapture a little of the glory of, but time slips away and leaves you with nothing, mister, but boring stories of glory days. For far too many of us, our glory days lie five years ago, ten years ago, thirty years ago. These are the stories we tell. And certainly they are defining miraculous stories about how God worked. But I believe right here we find in the message of the life of John Mark hope for us all. Hope for the brokenhearted. Hope for those whose dreams have been smashed. That the glory days don't have to be five years ago, 15 years ago. But the glory days can be now. If we but repent and surrender and become sold out disciples, God will use all of our hurts. As one guy says, don't waste your pain. (laughs) He'll use all the things that will happen to us so that we can minister to a whole segment of people, thus bringing more people into the eternal kingdom of God and thus more glory to God. Not in the former glory days but in these glory days. Thank you and God bless you.